Welcome everyone. Jim, why don't I turn it over to you? Hi everybody, thank you. This is the first and what we hope will be a, a series that will be beneficial to creating an opportunity for people to talk about, hear about, think about Lebanon and the many crises that it is facing as a country. Um, I'm, uh, I'm pleased that we're starting it with uh, the folks we have on today uh, because we had an earlier session as part of my coffee and column with them um, uh, Daisy Jadon, who is the filmmaker who made uh, just an extraordinary film on corruption in Lebanon called Enough, um, and, uh, and uh, Najat um, uh, Saliba and uh, uh, Milham, uh, no, sorry, what am I doing? Uh, and Milham uh, Khalaf are with us at Parliament. You can see they're in the dark because they've turned the power off in the parliament building there in a sit-in now going into its sixth week, I guess, or more. Yeah. Um, and demanding that their colleagues come back and vote because they have not voted um, in, in, uh, in all this time to elect a president. And we've seen these kinds of delays before, but given the crisis in Lebanon today, um, it is imperative that they end it soon, uh, sooner certainly than the one that lasted back, you know, back years ago. Uh, that lasted uh, way too long. I wanted to begin actually uh, with uh, introducing Daisy through the trailer for her film, which I had the privilege of being a discussant with her um, after the film when it premiered here in Washington. Um, and the trailer is really quite extraordinary. So if you don't mind, let me just, uh, she's an award-winning filmmaker, but this one I think is worth looking at. And in a future, one of these Lebanon conversations, we're going to show the whole film and have you give you an opportunity to to talk with her about it. So let's uh, let's show the film right now, the, the the trailer for the film right now. There's no sound. Do you really confront the causes of them? Who the hell is responsible? I still can't get the images out of my head. The explosion took me reeling back, back to the days of civil war. At the end of the war, the warlords were given promises of public money. We have the same politicians that they want to know. They're still here. It's like, what? You have so much vested interests in the system, which led us to this very tragic situation. Why didn't the president do anything about it? I don't know. Corruption is eating up everything in the country. We have to buy bottles of water, which costs more than petrol now. The crazy floating power station. The system will not be changed from the top. Elections are the only tool that we have. I don't believe the voting process is legitimate. So you feel confident with your decision? 100%. If we do not fix ourselves, the people will revolt their process. We Lebanese people are strong. It's very strong. We're stuck. What is your dream for Lebanon? To become a nation. This is a question only you can answer. Well, you get the gist. I'm sorry it wasn't, uh, Daisy, we're going to have to fix this before the next one. Um, but look, you, you get the gist. It's about corruption in Lebanon. It's about the position that Lebanon finds itself in after the port blast, after the, the, the a series of, of governments that uh, reflect, uh, I'd say the old regime, but the old regime is the, still the regime, it's the regime. And it is a, a, a series of feudal sectarian elites who have 
gobbled up the economy, gobbled up the ministries, uh, used the money that they drain from it as a patronage system uh, for their sects. Um, and uh, and th they brought the country to ruin. And Daisy, this film was so, when I saw your film, and I, I would see the little sections where you'd have the guy talking about, you know, we need this. The problem is corruption. The problem is corruption. And then you'd flash away and say, he owns the company that owns 80% of the, what, the, 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 the business that his ministry is dealing with. I mean, it, it's endemic almost in the system. Talk a little about that, if you would, and, and how deep this problem of corruption is that causes the paralysis we're, we're, we're seeing right now. Thanks, Jim, and thank you for having us back on again. This is a you know, very serious case, as you said, and the more we talk about it, the more um, I hope people around the world understand what's going on, because uh, information and education is the only way we're going to really help Lebanon, and it's not only incumbent upon the Lebanese, but people everywhere who believe in justice and who believe in democracy to stand up for the people here. And I apologize for the trailer. I think it's obviously a lag, but I think we can share the link so you can watch it on YouTube because it's uh, one of the most powerful trailers and won awards around the world. And I really want you to have a look at it. So hopefully um, Ellie or Maya can share the link in the in the chat. That's great, sure, thanks. Um, regarding the corruption, I mean, you know, it was, it was, took five years to really study this situation in Lebanon. Um, and that's considering I've been studying Lebanon and the Middle East since 19, the late 1980s. So that gives away my age. I've been uh, immersed in Lebanon's history and political long time, um, but really dived into this current uh, era of Lebanon from 2016. And it was a minefield that I just had to keep uncovering in order for me to be able to deliver a story that, you know, was credible and trustworthy. The most important thing was to deliver the facts um, and diving into the corruption. You're absolutely right. I had got the chance to interview, you know, the prime minister, the foreign minister at the time, Gibran Basile, the um, leader of the Lebanese forces, a lot of the, the leaders of the country who were, you know, that in the film it reveals that really there are six or seven people that run the country, and those are the people you're talking about, and that they have ties into every in every um, level of society and business, industry, and um, banks. You know, the, the reality is that when we were unraveling it and finding in more and more information, the conflict of interest was mind boggling. And coming from a country like Australia, it's the same rules that you have in America and every other democracy that I know where you can't have a conflict of interest. So that was like just baffling. It was baffling that this was allowed to happen. But what we discovered is that because these people were in power, they controlled the parliament, they could change the laws to suit themselves and to allow them to own businesses, to allow them to have, you know, that they would obviously put front men, but in the end, if you if you dug deep enough, you could find that they, their companies or relatives or them had those ties to those organizations. And, you know, there's this one company, um, the C Council of Reconstruction in Lebanon, it's been around since Rafiq Hariri's time when Solidaire started. And it's, the com it's the organization that gets the contracts from the government and then dishes them out and is supposed to tender out to businesses in across uh, Lebanon and the world. And it's remarkable how many times that those contracts go to, to companies that are owned by those families or relatives of those families. Um, so that's how deep it is. And it's, and it's at every layer of society across the country. And I'm sure... Melham and Najat would be able to give you far more detail, but it's, like you said, it's endemic, um, but it's not, it's not unsolvable, it's not irreversible, it just requires proper application of law, and people mm. in power, in parliament, who apply proper practice and governance, and we don't have that, we, the first time we saw that 
um, is in the last elections with the election of the new change MPs that Milham and Najat represent. We had 13 elected in May 2022. They dropped down to 12 because one of them got challenged in an appeal and now we're down to 12 real reformist change MPs in parliament now. But, uh, you know, what they're doing um, in parliament, okay, they don't have the numbers. There's 128 MPs that make up the Lebanese parliament. There are only 12. Of course, there's other smaller parties and groups that probably make up maybe 28 to 30 seats in the parliament that are really on the side of reform that you could really bank on. Um, but they don't have the numbers, they don't have the majority, but they have the visibility now. They are witnesses, they sit in parliament and they witness and they challenge and they're the watchdogs and they're really trying to be an opposition. And, um, and you know, they're getting great insight now as to how the system has worked for the last 30 yeah. to 40 years. Well, when we began this conversation, it was actually a, a paper that I had written uh, with Ralph Nader, we uh, we sent it out, calling yeah. for something, a fundamental change in the country. That is uh, going to the UN and saying, it's a basket case, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, we had done some polling for the American Task Force on Lebanon and were horrified to find the number of people. I mean, this is the, this is the country of, you know, some of the finest cuisine in the world and hunger, people who go mm -hmm. without a meal. The numbers are huge. Poverty levels, enormous. I was at church one Sunday um, and the priest said, let's uh, let's pray for those who are destitute in the world, the people of Haiti, Afghanistan, and Lebanon. And I sat in my pew and I cried. I said, mm -hmm. how has this happened in my mm -hmm. lifetime that we went from where we were to Haiti, Afghanistan, and Lebanon? I mean, you know, and so given that, uh, you end up who solves the problem it's the same people who make the problem that you send to solve it so ralph said let's throw it all the hell out and go to the un and declare a, a chapter seven um the region the people of lebanon need it uh, in the meantime there is this courageous stand being taken by the two of you <laughs> to say that's not going to happen for a while but what we can do right now is we can get the imf involved we can get some some immediate infusion of support to move this off the dime and get these people to just um, do something. And so I wanna to turn to you guys, you've been there now for six weeks. Um, uh, you're asking people just to come back and vote and get it over with, get a president, begin negotiations to get the IMF involved and, um, and tell me about it. How's it going? Let me start with you, Najat. How is it going? How are your colleagues receiving it? And are you getting public support for this effort to finally move the country off the dime and at least get this interim solution off the ground? Thank you, Jim, for inviting, for, you know, having given us the chance to talk about this again. Uh, no, I think, <laughs> I wish I can tell you that things are moving in the right direction. It seems like we're, you know, we're moving from one opposition to the other or one group, you know, threatening to boycott the sessions if they are whole, uh, if they are held to another group now threatening to boycott the sessions because mm -hmm. they don't want the others, the other party's candidate to be elected. So uh, we're seeing this uh, arm wrestling where one, one group uh, advances a candidate, the, the first, the left party or Hezbollah and his allies boycotted the sessions for the first 11 sessions. Now Hezbollah has a candidate, Hezbollah and, and co uh, ha, has a candidate. Now the uh, mostly, uh, oppos the opposition, mostly Christian are threatening to boycott the sessions. And so we're still in the same situation but the roles are reversed, unfortunately. And then when we start, when we talk with our colleagues and tell them, you know, listen, this cannot go forever like this. Something has to happen because if we keep, if we keep standing against each other, things are not gonna move. And at the same time, we're wasting time and people are suffering, like you're saying, 
they're dying from hunger and we have already five people who committed suicide and before they do they put this letter or this statement uh, you know on facebook or on social media saying that we have done it all we have tried it all and we cannot take it anymore one guy was uh, you know sent a voice uh, message to his friend asking him to take care of his family uh, and his kids uh, to look after them after he dies. Last night, I mean this night, a uh, few hours ago, somebody also said that after 40 years of work, I can't do it anymore. I have been, you know, my business was closed for three years, for three consecutive years. I have to give my um, business location I mean, to the land owner and uh, I can't take it. I can't restart all over again. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a complete denial and a complete detachment between the 128 MPs who are supposed to meet and elect the president and what's going on on the ground. And like you're saying, these people have been ruling the country for 48 years. They have confiscated every single bit of it. Uh, they have taken over everything and they have divided and shattered the, con the country into small uh, businesses or, or, you know, benefits and gains for them. Mm -hmm. And they look at us like crazy people asking them to respect the constitution, you know, and, uh, and they sealed us off completely, like, like you see, tried to connect to the rest of the world. Thank you, Jim, for responding few others also responding but not much to uh, to to have in order for us to really shake the ground of, of the let, let, uh, let me ask you uh, about the point of electing a president does it is it just to fill that damn seat and just get it done or does it matter who the president is because apparently it matters who the president is and there doesn't appear to be a compromise um, candidate in the in the mix. Um, so how do you get from where you are to where you want to be? Is it just getting them there all in the room to finally work it out? Or is there something else that has to happen? Hello, Jim. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, this opportunity. Uh, again, I'm sorry for my weakness uh, English, but I want to speak uh, uh, and express myself uh, 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 with uh, my little uh, uh, words. Uh, why I elect the president is important because uh, this is the first step to restore the, uh, the state and to restore the institutions. The, uh, that is the point. Actually, we are without uh, uh, cabinet. Uh, we uh, we don't have we have a vacancy in the uh, uh, in the presidents, and uh, we cannot uh, move to uh, manage the sufferings of the people. This is the real problem. Nobody is uh, react or uh, think about uh, uh, about how to manage the sufferings of the problems of our society, and how we can think about uh, the issue if you don't have a cabinet. If you want to make a cabinet, you should have a president. Uh, for this reason, the first step to restore the state, to restore the law of the states, we have to elect the president. Is the first step. Uh, other things we cannot move with any 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 uh, authority or powers look now the parliament actually we cannot make any any legislation because we we have to elect the president mm -hmm. if not we cannot make the 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 legislation we are in, how to say uh, it's like a a block system and actually we have to think how to restore the 
public institutions. This is the only way through the election of the president is the first step. And the second is to make a cabinet. And after then we can, uh, we can make, uh, we can uh, return to the democracy process mm -hmm. and hope uh, uh, apparently is a democracy process because under this appearance, we have a dictature of the really uh, uh, religious uh, aspect and they make their own uh, interest this is the real problem with this uh, person we have just five or six persons who can make any consensus and they can uh, 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 go through the law or against the law or against the constitution. Mm -hmm. Actually, what we are doing now, it's one thing, one thing to say. Our reference is the law. We have to apply the law. We have to apply the constitution. That's what we are saying since 92. Nobody asked about law or about constitution. They are asking about one thing, consensus and the consensus is only how to share the power they don't think about any sufferance or mm. any problem with uh, uh, about people they are not thinking about people that is the real problem and the the first step to to restore all these process is to elect the president um Thank you, guys. Uh, I, I know we have a video from uh, Daisy, but I'm a little leery about showing it right now uh, because of, until we have the, the the sound issue worked out. But there are a couple of people who I see out here who either question or comment uh, because they are longtime um, folks involved in 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 Lebanon. Uh, one is Jean Abinader, who uh, was one of the founders of the. Arab American Institute, and he's with the American Task Force on Lebanon and goes back way before then to the National Association of Arab Americans. Jean, um, uh, you, you've been writing commentaries uh, almost daily uh, on, on Lebanon. Tell me, tell me a little about what you're seeing right now and how you feel about what's going on with the, with the parliament and, and what these uh, two courageous members are doing. Well, first, I want to thank uh, yourself, but I want to thank Nishat Milham for participating in your show today, because I think it's only when you really are on the ground that you understand what's going on in Lebanon. The point that Melham made about electing president is central because the Taif Agreement 1990, 89-90, which ended the Civil War, essentially passed executive power from the Maronite Christian president to the Council of Ministers. There's supposed to be a readjustment of the power sharing agreement. So what we're seeing by blocking the Council of Ministers coming together, the Prime Minister, the Council of Ministers, the Ministerial Statement, which sets the guidance for the war for the uh, government, what you're seeing is the people in power are consciously manipulating the situation so the Lebanon fails. So the question is, what do they get, hope to gain from the failure of Lebanon, aside from institutional failures like the banks and the schools and the hospitals and all that. So one has the question, what's the motivation behind holding up these elections? Why are they so opposed to a normal consequence or sequence of events in Lebanon that says president, prime minister, council of ministers, ministerial statement, which sets up that those five things are necessary for a new government. Mm -hmm. But I think that to understand what Daisy's focusing on, the elite that's destroying Lebanon is essential because as you know, my job is to help craft policy for the US, you know, policy recommendations for the US government vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon. And we have a delegation going next week to Lebanon. As long as you said, Jim, as long as the same people are in, in power and if not then their children and grandchildren, it's really hard to understand or appreciate how to make change in Lebanon. They had a chance at the elections and they didn't do it. 
No different from us, by the way. If you, as you know from your polling, Americans never rate Congress more than 20, 22 percent favorability. And yet over 90 percent of all incumbents that run win their seats. It's the same in Lebanon. The clientism system that they have there almost forces people to vote for their along party lines, along the blocks. Lebanon's never going to move as long as it has a system that's based on, on sectarian blocks and on a government that isn't a government. Uh, I think the guy who has the worst job in Lebanon right now is Joseph Owen, the general, because he's at once a, a person who's being touted as a presidential candidate, and two, is the one that's faced whatever civil strife happens in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. So it's an impossible situation. I, I see I see Rafiq Bizarian. Um I've known Rafiq for decades and decades. Um, uh, Rafiq, are you there? Can you unmute him? So Rafiq, we've tried to. Uh, yes, I am. I am on. I am. Here on. he is. Hey, hi, Hello, Rafiq. How are you? So tell me a little about what you're seeing now. Rafiq ran the 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 Hariri Foundation here in Washington, um, and we've known him for, like I said, for decades as somebody who not only closely follows Lebanon but is deeply involved in 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 Lebanon. Tell me your reaction to what you're hearing right now. It is very hard to, to comment, uh, really. Uh, the, the country, it is going into uh, uh, deterioration, and this has been going on for the past several years. And uh, unfortunately, the current government, our previous governments, and all the parliamentarians, uh, uh, the majority, they are still in parliament. Uh, they are not helping the country, they are helping themselves. And we have uh, uh, some political parties that they are controlling the country as a whole. And as was mentioned earlier, now the two uh, group between Hezbollah and Amal movement, now they are calling for the parliament to come and convene. So the question is why they did not convened before, and they did not vote on a new president. And this, and, and the other aspect is on the financial. I mean, again, the financial uh, situation is getting worse and worse, as you all know. And I don't see any, uh, any light at the end of the tunnel on the financial aspects for the country as a whole. So things will get worse and worse as we uh, uh, check it every day. Okay. Najat, are, are, is there any, is there anyone who, who simply doesn't want to elect a president? Is there, is there a benefit served to any party uh, for not having a president and keeping the situation as it is? Uh, that's my, in my opinion, yes, of course, because Hezbollah managed to have a parallel economy in the country that is run on, based on cash economy. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that the other parties did not do, did not also contribute to the economic collapse, but we have a major, major problem here that uh, between Syria and, and what's going on in the region, there is a vested interest in having uh, in having a parallel economy uh, that uh, that does not really go into the system, a cash economy, which is very very bad for for uh, for uh, eliciting eliciting uh, you know any type of business, which is which is really a major major problem here, and you know we're trying to ignore the elephant in the room and say uh, and say okay we want to try to build a country. And that's why Milham and I are insisting, sorry, the, the camera keeps going and coming because it's an auto zoom, I have to fix that. <laughs> uh, so uh, so, so uh, we're trying to ignore, ignore this problem and say, let's elect the president. And from there, let's try to start, to start the reforms. But the, the truth and the matter is that we have a major, major problem in the country that has to stop 
uh, and and we have all the other warlords definitely mm -hmm. what can we do about it daisy um what are the what are the uh what are the the possibilities i mean i remember october 19th in I remember october rather in in uh um in 2019 mm. uh, it wasn't a revolution people use the word revolution a little loosely it was a revolt it was an uprising it was a mass mobilization it was really powerful um but it just petered away what what power alternative sources of power are there that can create movement um for for change um there are quite a few actually but I actually just go back to the revolution. I believe it was a revolution. I believe it still exists. I believe it just transformed into not a street revolution, but um, it's it's actually a, a psychological revolution. I think you. I was on the ground, um, you know, during the year, during just after COVID, because I mean, COVID killed revolutions all over the world. We had 39 revolutions in 2019. It was the largest number of revolutions in the world since the 1960s. And they were protests, but they were called revolutions. So we were one of those revolutions or the one that happened here. So I just think it had to change form because of COVID. Uh, but I, I've been on the ground before the elections and for a long time. And the psychology of the people across the country has definitely changed. And 2019, seven, October 17, 2019 was the moment. I mean, I had been studying it from 2016. I'd been back and forth and the shift was transformative. And I can tell you that because I had been, you know, been here talking to people. So to me, there was a reform a real revolution in the in the mindset of the people mm -hmm. and it was about courage they finally had the courage to stop being silent it was a revolution against silence they had just had the the, the bravery to step up and speak their truth finally so to me there are a lot of little layers of that um, but to go to your point about what can be done um, obviously we've got one course of action which and and this is with everything there has to be multi-layered approach to change and the first one is obviously to elect a president because that's the fundamental way to move the country forward and get some activity which is what Milham was explaining that you, we, we're not going to move the country can't move it's in a stalemate government's in shutdown you've got barely any public services being provided to the people no medications no no laws legislation being passed to bring any food medication even paying public servants they can't even pass a law because they they would be unconstitutional so the many things that are happening it's very complex at the moment and that's why a president whether it's someone we like or we don't like it's a function it's a role that will reactivate um the ability for the government to to govern so but what else, what else can we do? What we're doing now um, is really critical. What you're doing and putting um, a public face to it globally and bringing you know, hundreds of people from around the world and educating them, it's absolutely critical. It's empowering them, um, empowering people to be able to make better decisions and influence their uh, lawmakers in their own constituencies to be able to say, hey, look at Lebanon, don't forget about Lebanon, because Lebanon is off the agenda and has been off the agenda of most governments around the world and media. Uh, I've spoken to a ton of foreign media and media institutions, and they're all just, there's so much fatigue around Lebanon uh, because mm -hmm. it's just going back into the same cycle because the same people are still running the country. Um, we had a friend of ours who went to the EU, spoke at the EU Parliament uh, a few weeks ago, Nicola Shahani, a banker financier who understands the economic breakdown, and the EU Parliament were in shock. They had no idea what was going on because, um, and they, again, were like fatigued. It's off the agenda. Um, so we've got to put Lebanon back on the agenda everywhere, in the media, in govern governments, in the minds of the average person, that's why we need to have these sort of sessions. Um, and you know, that's another, why we're doing it. That's why we're doing. We have to. We have to educate. I was speaking at a forum in a summit in London in September. World leaders, current and former royalty, whatever, 120 delegates from around the world, 
And, you know, I, I spoke for 15, 20 minutes and spoke about the situation, spoke a bit about my film, showed them the trailer. It worked that time. <laughs> yeah. They were gobsmacked. They were like, we had no idea. We don't mm. receive any information about Lebanon. The last thing we heard about was a blast. Like, we want to mm. know, we want to help. We're really, we're astonished that this is going on and we don't know anything about it. It's just off the agenda. So we've got to get it back on the agenda. The UN Chapter 7 um, campaign is definitely another um, campaign we must um, focus on. Mm -hmm. But um, because it, it just, again, will bring it to the eyes and the ears of the United Nations. And I think if, if yeah. Ralph Nader and yourself and are able to bring it to that forum, it would be amazing. And there's, then that there's another idea uh, that uh, Nina Lahoud has placed in the chat. And I'm going to ask Milha, I'm going to ask him for you, Nina. Um, he, he, she asks, wouldn't it not be an idea to get as many members of parliament as possible to write directly to the secretary general and ask him to visit Lebanon because of the dire circumstances that are at, in place in the country in order to get a firsthand assessment and a, a way of sort of starting the conversation at, and you, it, sort of internationalizing the conflict through the secretary general. Does that make, is that something that you think could be done with beginning I mean, at least with the 12 of you? Uh, I mean, Milham, what do you think? I, Najat should answer that because she has been trying to reach out to the UN okay. and has had very little response, no, no, but I'll no. let her speak on that point. I think we did it together. I let Milham do that because we, we okay, go ahead. Uh, look, uh, we looking for uh, not only a moral support. We are looking also for uh, a really support. Mm. How to make it? First of all, to restore the state of flow, we have to uh, to have a support from the UN, from the EU, from the USA, from all the free world. Mm. And sometimes we are looking about the, the strategic approach. And the strategic approach is coming to say those governments are coming in Lebanon to support their own interest. For this reason, uh, this discussion or this uh, uh, webinar meeting is very important to have the support of the population. Mm. And this is very important. Mm. How can we uh, think about the the real support through a visit of many mem uh, parliamentary members of um, many uh, uh, countries from the free world. This is very important. Why? Because we want to share the values of the democracy. Actually, our uh, fight is to save democracy in Lebanon. And that's what we need. And of course, the first uh, reference to the values is the free world. And of course, also the uh, UN members or uh, UN uh, uh, bodies uh, who should be uh, with us in this stand. I think it's good also to push the parliamentary uh, members around the world to support our stand mm. uh, through the, some visits physically. It's very important because they will know the reality mm. of what we are living actually. And what we are living actually is out of any law, out of any legal body, out of any 
uh, uh, legal reference mm. that it's important to say and to to restore these uh, uh, these uh, values and these reference we need uh, of course uh, the support of uh, the uh, UN and the other uh, the other uh, parliament. I think uh, we make many uh, we we send many uh, letters to uh, the UN body, and uh, we wrote uh, uh, many letters to uh, to uh, European parliamentary, and. Uh, we are making all what we can uh, through these uh, letters, mm -hmm. and we hope we can uh, we can have this uh, support uh, through uh, these people. Listen, I, th I thank you for that, and I'm going to. I mean, if you don't mind, I'm going to work with you and see if we can come together with a letter that we can use to give to them and a process to get it through. We can get a dozen or so members of parliament on a letter to the secretary general with specific ask. I think that might be a, a helpful approach. Maya, you had somebody you wanted to bring in? I did. I want I want to call on Dr. Greg Germanis um, to just offer what you posted in the chat, um, uh, Greg, the quote that I, I think talks about the, the issue of resilience. Um, I'm trying to unmute you, but I think you have to do something on your end. Are you able to unmute, Greg? There we hey, go. Here, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maya. Thank you, Jim. And thanks, especially to uh, Daisy and the members of Parliament. Uh, learned helplessness is a concept that's been around a long time, and from my perspective, many of these ideas about the future are good, in terms of politics, elections, etc. But until you get the people with some sense of hopefulness, hopefulness. Hopeful, hopefulness is not the cure, but hopefulness is a prerequisite to any change for progress. And that might be achieved through, you know, trying to use some channels like the psychology departments of young people in AUB and other universities, because they're not as pessimistic as we are. Just an observation. Thank you for allowing me to say that. Greg, share the quote with us from, from uh, Gibran. This was from two cities. Uh, to remain forever gazing, this is just the, the last line in it. To remain forever gazing upon the city of the past is folly. Behold, the city of the future beckons. Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Daisy, I wanted to ask you, ask you about that because Greg wrote that a while ago uh, to me as something that we needed to think about. And as we're sort of closing out here, the, the I have found myself in a funk over the last couple of months, whether I'm talking about Palestine or Iraq or about American politics or whatever. I mean, it's bleak. And I, I know that uh, from my life and my work that bleak never wins, right? People need, I used to say this to, to Clinton uh, during, the, during the, the 90s, I'd say people need a vision of the future so compelling they're drawn toward it and contrasting it with the current dy dy dynamic, which becomes so repulsive that you want to, to, to give it up. The question is, what's the vision of the future? We, we all, I mean, we've always had, we grew up with the, the Lebanon, the, the stories of the villages and the, the, the life we had in Lebanon, but what's the vision of the future? What, what do you present to people? Uh, and I think maybe we're not gonna do that right now, but it's something that we have to think about is, um, hmm. What do we want people to grab onto as the Lebanon that you want to build for the future? Hmm. Um, I just want to. Um, this is what I why I had this segment in my film, which I hope we'll all get to see in a couple yes. of weeks. It was called My Lebanon, and I had a Gibran poem um, as an allude into that. But to show people what's at stake to have people feel what they're missing out on. If those people who've never been to Lebanon and the Lebanese who are here, who've forgotten what is the richness, the values, the virtues, the, 
the vision, the remarkableness of this country that the whole world will, will lose if we don't protect it. It's it's a unique diamond in the midst of this in the midst of this region, but also in the middle of the world. Um, I can't tell you how many people of many ethnicities have said to me, "We've never been to a country like Lebanon, even with the situation as it is now." And I just had a visitor from London, a, a British um, journalist, who came out, and he's you know been a journalist for fifty six years. He's seventy two years old. His name's Ian Pelham Turner. And he was, he couldn't believe it. I mean, how sophisticated, how glamorous, how elegant, how rich in history and culture, in diversity, you know, this the contradiction that the country is, but such a vibrancy that he was, you know, he just wanted to come back and he will be coming back. He's just, we need to show the world this Lebanon because then the people of the world will want to love and protect this Lebanon because we haven't seen this Lebanon since the 60s and the 70s and only a handful of people remember that Lebanon. But I, and this is something that we're working on. I'm working on with him, with our team here in Beirut now. I've got a company here and I'm pushing out as much media and information to the world about the current situation. Um, unfortunately, it's a bit serious all the time, but sometimes we do some fun, real, really nice stuff. But that's what we need to focus on as well. And one of the one of the ele elements of my film is um, I asked people three things. Every single interview that I did over 200 interviews, I asked them three questions. What do you love about Lebanon? What do you dislike about Lebanon? What you What is your dream for Lebanon? So I've got 200 answers and we're compiling these to remind people and we'll showcase them and share them with you um, when we, we're ready to launch them. But the dream of Lebanon, um, what it was in the past is one element of what it was, but there's so much more that it could be. And it was before Dubai, before Saudi Arabia, before Qatar, before Bahrain, which have all now, you know, um, succeeded Lebanon so many times, but with, it's the Lebanese, with Lebanese brain. With, with Lebanese expatriates. Exactly. The Lebanese brains have built those cities, but um, it won't take much to, to restore Lebanon because it's a tiny little country, but it needs a will and the, a political will. And unfortunately, that's what we're missing. And um, Greg Shimanis is absolutely right. The people are hopeless at the moment. They're feeling helpless and hopeless. Um, and I, I'm, they're, they're shocked that I've come back to live in Lebanon when I could be living on Bondi Beach and my, you know, enjoying myself. But I, um, it's, it's because I can see the future. I can see when I drive up the, you know, villages and through the mountains and through the streets of Beirut and you see these cobblestones. I could see it all clean. I can see it look like you know the streets of Rome and Florence and Paris and London and it's just got this incredible architecture that's so beautifully European mixed with this orientalism that is stunning you know we we don't have that in many other countries and the liberalism of Lebanon there is no country in the Middle East or North Africa or Africa that has the liberalism the sophistication and that's why this is special and that's what we can't let go of. We shouldn't let go of and I won't let go of. And I know Najat and Milham and many others. And I want, want to mention one other thing that's really powerful is our diaspora. We have you know, millions and millions of people in the diaspora and I'm working with them, um, you know, really sophisticated, uh, successful people beyond comprehension who have reignited their interest and passion for Lebanon and they are the game changer. They can be a tremendous force and we're trying to bring that group together, bring a, a united group together in some sort of coalition to really actively work in an organised manner and create a roadmap and a strategy for the country from our perspective to really help Lebanon internally. So there's a there are many things that can be done and that and we are trying to do it's not like it's hopeless and there's nothing it's just there's so much to do um and any help from anyone would be very greatly appreciated especially with getting the word out you know especially let me, with let me put up your uh, uh daisy's email uh, if you could put up as a board or something so 
not just look in the chat because I want uh, people, there it is. Yeah. It's at Dream Creations INTL. Yeah. Yeah. for International. Yeah. .com. Easy. Write to her if you want to uh, be involved. Uh, there's a petition that will be circulating. There's some actions that they're going to be calling for. Uh, mm -hmm. There's other forms of support that people are uh, are considering, and it would be um, it'd be really helpful uh, to to be in touch with her. Um, I'm going to close this out, and I thank you all Sorry, so Jim, much. Jim, Jim, may I add something about uh, your question yes. about the vision of yes. Lebanon? Please look around the world. You have two or three country who represent some values. You know, when you talk about uh, about freedom, immediately in our conscience uh, around the world, the state, the United States, is the reference. Mm. When you talk about human rights, the first idea to re to represent these idea is France. Mm. And when you talk about live together, you have to think about Lebanon. If we lose this reference, mm. it will be a big worse or a, it will be a, a worse case for also the, uh, the world. Mm. When you talk about vision, our vision is to give the the, the, the message of this country. And the message is how to live together and don't see only the political uh, collapse or the political uh, uh, class. We have to see the reality of our population. And our population is, they are a champion of how to live together. Mm. In political level, they are failed this approach. But in the society, society level, it's mm. amazing reference. Yeah. And for this reason, we have to save this idea around the world. How to live together, it's mm. a way to give peace in the world. And if we lose this idea, we will lose many, many things around the world and we will lose something special, how to live together. It's a, it's a laboratory, it's a, uh, a real case. It's a re uh, yes, it's a, it's a real case about uh, uh, coexistence, coexistence uh, message. Thank you. Can well, I just give I, that I, a little I, bit more you. context? Pardon? Can I give that just a little bit more context? Because at the EU, with all the problems in Europe, with all, it all opening up, they're actually facing a tremendous crisis with how to deal with so many religions going into so many areas because the borders are all open. And they are looking at Lebanon as a reference because we've got 18 different religious sects who live very harmoniously together, as Milham just explained. You go anywhere in Lebanon and they actually are very respectful and loving and appreciative and accepting of each other. And that's what Pope John Paul II, we keep repeating this, in 1997 when he came to Lebanon to deliver the findings of the a special synod on Lebanon, mm -hmm. he said Lebanon is a message for the world. And uh, Tom Fletcher, the former UK ambassador who was featured in my film, he wrote letters and he he spoke about this that you know if we lose lebanon if then we lose it for the world because lebanon is about bringing down walls other countries are about building walls and this is the example that the world needs to protect because we have been living it for thousands of years not a hundred years i mean the people have been living coexisting for thousands of years well, I'm not going to be a party pooper here, but I do want to add a note of um, bring it down a little bit, just a little bit, because there is that lovely poem by Gibran, you have your Lebanon, I have mine, and I uh, um, and I do, I 
I adore the words and I adore the thought behind them. Mm. But a lot of what we're talking about is a Lebanon of the past. The reality yeah. is that we went through a civil war and it was a horrific experience. And I remember going back to visit my family in the, in the 90s um, mm. and said, I wanted to go to Sur. They live up in the in the in Kisruen, and they, my cousins had never been there, a country that small. They'd never been there, mm -hmm. and they thought it was dangerous to even consider going there. I mean, it's like Washington D.C., one little city, but people don't go from northwest to southwest. They just don't, or southeast rather. You just don't. It's like it's in your head. It's all one place, but in reality, it's I'm here, and I don't even know who they are over there, and. Um, and there are there, there's a fragility to this vision of Lebanon that I don't think any of us can ever ignore. If you, I, I think it, I, it's what I say about America. I say that that there is uh, there's the Statue of Liberty, hmm. right? And there's also uh, uh, Donald Trump, <laughs> and there's you know Bull Connor, and there that both of them are who we are. Hmm. And I don't want to ever forget the Donald Trump because if I forget him. He's going to take over. I also That's don't want right. to forget the promise of the lady in the harbor, because if I forget that, then there's no hope. That's so right. I want to keep both in perspective that we've done horrible things to each other. We've done horrible. And, and, and Lebanon today, the poverty level is enormous. There, there's both. There's civility and there's incivility. There's, right. there's the quality of life that we, we, we know. There's also the, the, the people who are struggling just to get a meal on the table for their kids and committing suicide. So I, I, I'm just, I'm sorry to say this now, I, I know we have to go out, but I, but there's both of them are in one place and somehow we need to inspire people not to ignore the realities that are right in front of them, but to feel that we can surmount those and go someplace else. Um, I, I just wanted to throw that in if, if it's okay. And look, yeah. everybody, thank you so much. Yeah, and, and uh, Najat, I'm gonna come to you, but we're a little over time, but I do wanna say next week or in two weeks, we're gonna show Daisy's film enough. We're gonna show a little earlier cause it's late for her and I want her to be able to comment on it a bit. And uh, we'll have a few other people commenting as well, but thank you so much everyone for joining in. And Najat, the final word's gonna be yours. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanna, uh, uh, I want us to think about Lebanon, not only the small Lebanon that we have over here, but we have 15 million people outside all across the world. And you are one of them. Nina Lahoud is another person who helped me a lot to actually be able to communicate with you and officials. We've had so many conversations over the phone. Thank you, Nina. And then really, really, our 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 extension to the world is is everyone is our friends our diaspora and a lot of lebanese who are willing to help and i'm sure you can put pressure on your uh, senators on your countries to only protect the values and defend democracy we don't want any interference in our in our you know day to day politics it's not that we want the values to be safeguarded and if we do protect the values here we will protect them everywhere in the world we really need your help we rely on you and we really uh, we're really here to fight and to do our fight but we can't do it alone Thank you so much, Najat. Thank you, Milham. Thank you, Daisy. See you in two weeks when we show the film. Uh, the rec this recording will be available if you're interested. Just let us know and we'd be happy to send it to you. And Maya, you had something else you wanted me to, to add? No, no, I just, uh, that was it. Thank you, everybody. Um, um, well, actually, the only other point is that we do have a group of friends, Jim, that are um, traveling to Lebanon this week. And, and I think that um, um, Jean mentioned the ATFL delegation. There are others. So perhaps we can also have folks when they come back on right. future discussions. Right. Yeah, okay. And idea. if you have ideas of future uh, discussions that you'd like us to have, please send them along. Uh, I would love to have them and work with them and see what we can do to keep this conversation. I just think talking about Lebanon is important and we don't do it enough. It's it's kind of like in politics, it's the vacant lot where everybody fights their fights. Um, in, um, in our daily life, it's always superseded by what's happening here, what's happening there in the rest of the neighborhood. 
and and Lebanon gets uh, gets ignored. So we're not doing it anymore. Thank you. We'll what, see you in two weeks. Once Bye. Thank you. We once need more. Syria. Yeah, and I just, uh, Jonathan is with us and he mentioned something very important and that is that these conversations are great, but he's also saying, what are the concrete asks that we can have for people who love Lebanon and want to do more? So we're going to be sending them all to you. And Daisy's exactly. got some ideas that we're working on, including a petition that we want people to sign in and get broader support for, but we will get back to you. Thanks for bringing that up, Maya. And thank you, Daisy, for helping. Thanks, Najat. Thanks, Milham. And thanks to the rest of you. Take care. Thank you all for watching and being Thank kind. you. Thank you. Thank you.